Before we get started with the presentation, I just want to uh, check and see by a show of hands who is familiar with .NET programming. Okay, that's actually a lot more than I expected. And uh, who has played around with .NET Core so far? Okay. And who still thinks this is a Java session? <laughs> nice. So, um, just a, a little bit before we get going. Um, I've spent most of my career doing .NET programming and only recently started doing things like uh, this, this Java thing I, I heard about once. Um, uh, okay. So, yeah, uh, I spent most of my career doing uh, .NET programming and uh, apparently I can't touch anything. And so uh, I work for Pivotal and uh, we do application migrations for customers teaching them how to move their applications to the cloud. So I'm Chris Humble. I'm also on the uh, Cloud Foundry Solutions team for Pivotal. Um, I spent a good majority of my career actually working with the Microsoft stack. Uh, several years working as a SQL Server DBA as well. Uh, and then the rest of it working with different uh, OSS stacks. Uh, and then a couple years just smushing those two together. And at this point, I'm kind of like a professional smusher of those two things. And that's sort of the genesis of, of why we're interested in, in this stack now. So before we go, I uh, need to take just a, a quick moment to uh, shamelessly indulge in some promotion here. The content that we're doing now is eventually going to end up as a book. Uh, which will have uh, far more detail than the, the really high-level stuff that we're going to talk about today. So the basic, the way this is going to go down, assuming Kevin doesn't get too incredibly feedbacked, is that he's going to yak and he's going to gab and he's going to drone on um, and learn you guys about .NET Core. And then I'm going to follow him up by essentially building an application from scratch for you using .NET Core. Um, we're going to talk about an, an awful lot in that period. We're going to put an, an app together. Um, we're going to talk about uh, things like MVC, um, uh, dependency injection, and we're also going to do things like consume Spring Cloud services with a project called Steeltoe. Um, so that's where we actually have a spring angle. So this is .NET. Um, however, we're going to start to use some services you may be familiar with already on the spring side. And we're going to do this actually all 100% using Unices. We're going to do this on a combination of Mac and Linux. There's, there's no Windows involved whatsoever. Uh, we're not going to pass judgment on, on anything that does uh, that is Windows-based. But the idea here is we're trying to demonstrate the portability. And there's no emulation. There's no Win API emulation. There's no mono, no trickeration, no funny business. This is, this is purely on Unix. So I asked before uh, who's done a little bit of .NET programming. Has anybody done uh, ASP.NET web application development? A couple. OK. So some of you will be familiar with some of the pain I'm about to describe. Well, that's better. Yeah, there you go. Sound good. Yep. Yeah. So um, one of the first things that people are familiar with is maintaining Windows servers. And Windows servers were uh, designed, architected, and built prior to uh, this cloud thing that we all know about today. So there's a lot of assumptions about user interactivity, uh, persistence, uh, security, and uh, a whole bunch of things that tend to fall down pretty quick when you try and run Windows in the cloud. Deploying a web application basically went one of two ways. The smart way would be to deploy the application with Active Directory group policy, so the app gets pushed to a server automatically. Uh, what I see more often than I should is someone remote desktops into a production server and runs an installer. It's very bad for a number of reasons. And then, of course, we have to maintain and configure Internet Information Server. Windows servers are generally treated as uh, long-lived pets. Uh, they, the people who own and maintain them, love them, care for them, and hug them, and, and keep them alive. 
<clears throat> and because of this longevity, it makes it extremely hard to do the three R's for security on Windows servers in the cloud. It makes it very hard to take them down and uh, bring them back up again quickly. Historically, uh, ASP.NET development has been uh, tightly coupled to the Microsoft ecosystem. You, you basically had to buy in whole hog on all the Microsoft tools, all the Microsoft libraries. Uh, everything was provided for you, and, and you, you either had little choice or you had an illusion of choice. Most of it was closed source. There was a brief period where you were able to see some of the Microsoft source code, but uh, there were actually legal implications from having viewed that source code. And it was, and still is, all or nothing. You, if you're going to use ASP.NET, you have to use all of it. And the server has to have the whole thing on it just for your app to start up, regardless of what it does. So <clears throat> the future, as always, is full of rainbows and unicorns. And that's .NET Core. .NET Core uh, allows for modern, immutable, dependency vendored artifacts. Modular, uh, so rather than one giant monolith, you import just what you need. Uh, that ends up allowing you to be uh, very lightweight. <clears throat> you get to maintain uh, Linux servers instead of Windows. There's no internet information server, and I can't stress enough how much pain this relieves. Those of us who've had to suffer through both writing code for and maintaining IIS uh, basically threw a party when we saw this. Linux servers are, I say, cloud ready because you still have to do work to make them uh, run happily in the cloud, but uh, by default, they are easier to treat as disposable, uh, short lived. All of .NET Core is open source from the runtime to through all of the frameworks. And just want to mention one more time, there's no IIS. <laughs> you can actually do ASP.NET Core on Windows if you want. And a lot of people are using it as a stepping stone to get away from the Windows ecosystem. So they'll move from legacy ASP.NET to core on Windows, and then gradually remove all the bits that only run on Windows, and moving towards core on Linux. And Microsoft has said that their future direction is core, so I wouldn't be surprised if ASP.NET 4.6 was the last release of non-core ASP.NET. So inside ASP.NET core, you have the cross-platform open source runtime, um, and that includes just the smallest amount of code required to start up a simple uh, console app. Everything else that you need, you include one piece at a time, one package at a time. You can write console apps, web apps, which we're going to show today, uh, universal Windows apps, and uh, <coughs> .NET Core is part of the .NET Foundation, which is uh, a collection of open source .NET projects. And if you want to go to that, that link, you can see pages and pages of, of open source .NET stuff. .NET Core is also uh, essentially a rewrite based on 14 years of learning what not to do. Uh, and yeah, both of us actually started when both of us were developing when ASP.NET 1.0 came out. You, you also get an MVC framework uh, that's included as a module. You don't have to take it if you don't want to. But that includes things like server-side rendering, uh, routing, and this is what you would use for microservices. Um, for those who've done a little bit of dabbling with microservices prior to core, this is essentially a merge of the old MVC framework and the old Web API framework, and it's now uh, consolidated. So to get started with .NET Core, first thing you do is go and download the runtime from Microsoft. And um, on pretty much any platform, it's pretty easy to get. You get a command line tool called .NET. Uh, you run .NET new to create two files your program file and uh, a JSON file that has your project's dependencies listed in it. Uh, for those of you who are doing uh, Java development, um, 
this is a pretty familiar pattern of just creating an empty program file and then an empty pom file with your dependencies. .NET Restore will uh, detect your dependencies by reading the configuration file and then uh, go out and vendor them. It locks them to a specific version number uh, so that you can then deploy your application with, without changing its dependencies. It also will compile the app and then .NET Run executes your application. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris for a quick demo. All right. So now we're going to take a little detour. So um, at this point, you've probably gathered that, <coughs> excuse me, that Kevin and I are some, some pretty hip and trendy guys. And we're going to build an app for you. So it's going to make sense that we're going to build a hip and trendy app. Uh, so this is, a, this is a million dollar idea, billion dollar idea, by the way. So it's so like, don't take it and run with it. What we're going to do is we're going to build a service that allows users to get a collection of offensively cute monsters and then grab them. It's going to be called Grabimon. You may have heard of something like this. Now, again, this is a billion dollar idea. Billion dollar, maybe more. Uh, and I don't think it violates any IP. Um, no, no legal issues at all. Right. Um, now, the home game on this, I'm going to be typing the word .NET a lot, like Kevin mentioned. The, the CLI for doing .NET Core work is the .NET command. The home game on this is to see how many times I type it and how many times I screw it up in the presentation. Because uh, I'm going to hit backspace a lot. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to start out with a very basic application. We're going to start out simply with Hello World. We're just going to build, we're actually gonna, not going to build anything. Um, we're going to do a, a bare minimum of code generation to get us our basic framework. Uh, in general, we're going to avoid doing things like using templates. If you, if you look around for tutorials in .NET Core, you'll see things like Yeoman templates. But uh, we believe that code generation is generally for noobs, so we're going to avoid it. Um, so to get started, .NET new in an empty directory. And now we have two files that it spat out. The first thing that we're going to look at is the project JSON. So this is essentially the metadata that the build system for application is going to use. There's all sorts of funny business in here. Uh, there's versioning information. There's also a dependency list, kind of like your gem file or what, what have you. At this point, it's empty because we have no dependencies. Um, and then we're also going to define what framework we intend to run in, in this case, .NET Core. And we also have a program CS which is actual source code. Uh, this is the only uh, code uh, that is going to be generated for us. And if you're a .NET programmer, this should look pretty darn familiar. There's nothing funny here at all, right? It's a namespace, a class, and a static entry port for our app. And all we're going to do is shove hello world out to standard out. So now that we've nude, we will do a restore to pull down our empty dependency list. We will actually compile the darn thing. And then we run it. We have Hello World the standard out. So that actually concludes the generation that we're going to have. From here on in, it's going to be all by human fingers. So now that we've got a uh, basic Hello World console application, we're going to convert that into a web application. And uh, if, w if you've had any experience with Visual Studio in the past, you'll, re you'll know that this is generally something that used to be impossible. Once you picked your Visual Studio template, that was it. Until the end of time, your application could never change. Uh, it's, it's no longer the case. So. We're going to do that by adding some middleware to a request pipeline. Uh, middleware is uh, components that we add to the request pipeline to uh, read and manipulate re requests and responses. Um, you can then either defer execution or branch execution or terminate the request pipeline inside your middleware. Uh, people have used middleware for serving up static files, for doing error handling, for doing authentication and for doing MVC. And I think a, an important point to point out is that all of those different pieces of middleware are now completely separate and modules that you can pull in one at a time. You don't have to pull in the entire ASP.NET 
just to get static files or just to get error handling. And so we're going to do a quick demo to convert Hello World into a Hello World web app. So amazing. I even typed git correctly. All right, so at this point, this isn't an apology, but what we're going to do right now is actually build the dumbest middleware in the history of building middleware, uh, which is pretty impressive because I've seen some dumb middleware. Um, but what we're going to do is start adding uh, basically a request pipeline to our application. Um, and we're going to start by adding a, de a dependency for the Kestrel web server. Essentially, that is a self-hosted web server that should feel pretty familiar to anyone uh, like, like uh, uh, working with Spring Boot because you're used to TC server or in the, you know, the Ruby world with, with WebRick, et cetera. Uh, fundamentally, the idea is here, this is uh, the kind of thing that you're going to put some kind of reverse proxy in front of. Uh, so this is, is ideally cloud native from the get-go. And that's going to be the, the only dependency we're going to add at this point. Now, we're going to make, oops, and also how many times can I spell Emacs wrong? We're going to make some relatively significant changes to our entry point, where rather than spitting hello world out to, con uh, to standard out, we're going to create a web host builder. We're going to instruct this to use Kestrel, so it actually starts a web server for us. Um, and then we're going to um, tell it to use a startup class. This is something we're going to look at in a minute. And this is, this is going to be probably the place where we're going to spend actually most of our time in terms of configuration for our application. <clears throat> and then we run the app. Now, if we look at where we define our middleware in this startup class, uh, you'll see basically that we have a startup with a configure, which is where it's going to uh, modify our request pipeline. And the net result of this is that it's going to respond, hello world, on any route to any request method that you have. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, it barely feels like it's useful, and that's because it isn't useful, but it's going to be our starting point. So now we will repeat our build process. So we have to restore to pull down our new dependency. And we will run our application. So now rather than just terminating and returning to the console, you'll see that it is listening on port 5000. And we can hit it with a get request. We get a hello world. We can actually get hello world from all sorts of insane things. Not ideal, but that's where we start. So now that we have uh, something that is completely useless, we need to convert that into something a little bit more useful. So we're going to convert that into uh, exposing some data over RESTful routes. And anybody who's used Spring Boot should uh, be pretty familiar with the pattern we're about to look at. You can attach an attribute to the top of a class to define a root route for every one of the methods on that class. So in this case, if we had a controller called monster, it would have, it would have created a path called API slash monster. You can, uh, <clears throat> you can put attributes on individual methods. Uh, and this is essentially where you're going to put your get, put, post, delete operations. You can tag a parameter to your method for automatic deserialization. So if you just put the from body attribute in front of a C sharp class, uh, ASP.NET Core is going to take care of uh, converting the, uh, the payload on the HTTP request into that object, and you can customize how that serialization works if you want. We return an instance of an object called action result, and this contains the HTTP result code, you know, 200, 201, and, and so on, as well as the body of the response. Uh, these methods all support the async keyword, so we can do all this stuff uh, asynchronously. And we can also explicitly add routes, add, um, add RESTful routes. Uh, 
we can also do uh, global context routes, which come in handy when working in PCF. So you can have your application run in the root context when you're testing it locally, and you can have it run under some other context when you've deployed it to, uh, to your foundation. And there's a blog post here on, on how to go do that. You can also mix and match. You can combine explicit routes with implicit routes at the class level and implicit routes at the method level. <clears throat> Once you have a controller that has your RESTful routes uh, interface defined, you probably need to get some dependent object in order for the controller to do meaningful work. So for that, we're going to use dependency injection. Uh, and this, uh, you know, for obvious reasons, makes it easier to test as well as run. So you can do scope services where the object being injected lives as long as the request. Global services, so the object is, uh, lives as long as the process. The entire configuration subsystem can be injected into your controller, so you have access to the config values, and uh, we'll be showing some of that later. Um, you can inject middleware, and then you can also inject the dependencies for your middleware through DI. It comes with a default container, and that's usually the one we use, but if you have a preference or if you're migrating an application that already used a different container, you can customize it and use your own. So let's do yet another demo, and we'll convert the Hello World into a decent controller. All right. I don't know about decent, but it'll be a generous. controller. Move on to the next step. OK, so in this step, we're actually going to go through an awful lot. Um, we're going to cover both a basic controller as well as uh, demonstrate dependency injection. Um, and we're going to start out in the typical spot where we're going to start most of our steps when we do new things. We're probably going to be adding new dependencies. Uh, in this case, because we're going to be interested in models and controllers anyway, we're going to add MVC. Um, and then if we're going to do DI, we're going to need to inject something. We're going to need something to inject. Um, and we're going to use a repository in this case, a memory repository of monsters. If we have a repository, we probably need a model. So we'll actually have a model of monsters. So here's a basic model we're going to use. <clears throat> nothing, nothing particularly fancy here. Just a monster that is identified and has a name. And then to briefly show you the repository that we're going to use, um, here is just a repository that can perform CRUD operations storing the monsters in memory. Uh, when the process ends, the repository goes away and it's gone. This would be used for testing that kind of thing. Um, and we'll explain why it's important that we have a, a interface upon which we're going to be the implementation. So now we're going to visit our startup and actually see the, the configuration for the, the dependency injection. When Kevin uh, just mentioned the idea of a scope dependency, this is how we add a scope dependency. Each request is going to get one instance of what we define here. If it said an, add transient, you would get a new object each time you requested it. And if you said add singleton, you would get it globally for the entire process. But we're going to say that any time a controller or anything living in the space of our DI container asks for a iMonster repository, we will give it an implementation um, called the memory monster repository. And then we actually need something to serve web requests and receive this repository by DI. So here's our first controller. Um, you'll see that we're setting up a routing system, API with a controller name that is the root for our class. Uh, and then we have a a constructor here that receives a iMonster repository implementation, and this is actually the DI. This is constructor injection. Uh, and then we have a number of actions we've defined in our, con in, in our controller, uh, such as you can get a list of all monsters in our repository, you can get a specific monster from the repository, you can create a monster and slap it in the repository, the basic kind of stuff you'd expect. Um, and then you also see here, the from body attribute. 
Uh, this is where deserialization happens. So if you shove JSON in a JSON monster, JSON comes out. So we'll do a restore. This time it's going to, I believe, pull down MVC for the first time. We will compile. Then we will run our application. Now we're going to an issue, issue a get against API monsters. And it's empty because it's a brand new repository with nothing in it. So we can make one by posting a monster named .netamon. And now we have one monster in our list. Then let's, let's make another one, maybe Rubamon. Post that in. And our list has grown. So essentially, the controller received its repository through DI. It, it didn't know what specific impl implementation it would receive. So at this point, we have a microservice that we built from scratch. Uh, we didn't use any wizards or templates or, thankfully, Visual Studio. And so now what we want to do is talk about uh, putting this microservice in a continuous delivery pipeline. And uh, for ease of demo and to illustrate that we have options, uh, we, we chose to use Worker for this. So the first thing is the motto should, all, should be always be deploying. And when building the code, uh, developers should consider that every commit they make could end up in production by the end of the day. And that's, that's often a, a pretty hard uh, mentality for people to switch to. And the only real way to get over that is to deploy more often rather than less. So for the continuous delivery pipeline that we have that we're going to demo, uh, we check in. Uh, the code gets built in the cloud. We run our unit tests. We run any UI tests if we have them. And because we've got a, a ton of stuff to show, uh, we didn't want to get bogged down in showing actual tests. But um, again, there might be something in the book that you might want to pre-order. <laughs> saying. Um, we then run integration tests. Uh, we deploy the result of that passing test to Docker Hub. And then we push the Docker image to our cloud environment. And all of this takes place automatically after we uh, get commit. So one of the benefits that we get from doing a combination of Docker images and a cloud-based CI tool is uh, we've completely eliminated the works on my machine problem. If, it, if the test passes, we have really high confidence that the test is going to pass everywhere and that the functionality is going to work identically no matter where we put it. So we can spin up backing services and containers. Those can be our services, they can be databases, they could be queues. It doesn't make any difference. We can then run in our, our integration tests against the backing services. Um, the key here is that the tested artifact is exactly the deployed artifact, and there is never any change between the thing that passed the tests and the thing that's running in production. And uh, we can also do some extra fancy stuff with acceptance test environments. So uh, you know, microservices are rarely ever isolated, and we want to know how they behave with other services. So we can push an entire suite of services and uh, run all of those tests. So Chris is going to do a demo of the CI pipeline. All right. So. Before I demo, I'm going to do something without explaining it, which is I'm going to do a commit. A meaningful one. A very meaningful commit. Very new feature. Mm -hmm. And that's actually going to kick off a build process for us. Now, before I start explaining this, is, is Joe Fitzgerald here anywhere? Good, good. So 
Uh, nobody, nobody tell Joe what's about to happen. When he sees this, he's going to fire me. So you really need to understand that I went out on a limb for you today. Um, when he sees that, that we did that we used Docker for this, he's going to be angry. Um, however, we're going to try to make him happy by ultimately deploying to Cloud Foundry, because, like I said, we're hip and trendy, and that's where all the cool kids deploy their code. Um, so what we're going to do is before we start worrying about CI is we are going to make our app more cloud native. As it stands, it just starts up, listens on port 5000, and, and continues on merrily. We need the ability to inject the port by way of environment variable to make Cloud Foundry happy. So in order to do that, we will, you'll see a lot of builders in .NET stuff. It's kind of like the factory, factory, factory from Java. But we're going to create a, con a config builder, and we're going to um, grab arguments from the command line, put it in the builder, and then pass that configuration source uh, into our, our web layer. So Kestrel receives it, and it's going to know about certain config options, such as server.urls that can tell it where it's going to start up and run. And then we're going to create a Docker entry point shell script. The idea is that when our container runs, it's going to know that it can pass in a server URLs parameter, which is why we added our, our command line parser, uh, where it listens on all IPs and uses either the port environment variable or a sensible default. Uh, so this should make Cloud Foundry happy. Now we're going to look at some actual pipelines here. So uh, in this case, we chose Worker largely because it, it, it works fine with Docker. Um, we did have to actually use our own Docker uh, uh, image for, for doing this step because the images currently available for Microsoft for working with Core have been a little flaky. Um, however, it's still generally a solid pattern. Um, and you'll see that we have two pipelines here. We have a build step, which does this, the same kind of stuff that I've been kind of miskeying for the presentation. And then a deploy step that actually does a Docker push to Docker Hub. So the result is, we do a commit, a build happens in Worker, and a Docker image is spat out the other side into Docker Hub so we can use it. Now, what we should see in my list of things, so right here, you can see that the, pipe, the pipeline was kicked off three minutes ago. Uh, that was by me doing a commit to the readme. Typically, that would be a more meaningful commit, but I think you get the idea. And due to the magic of television, I can show you how you could deploy that image. So here's a case of us taking the .NET Core services, grabbing on demo image that we, we defined in the, the deploy pipeline, and we're going to push it to CF. In this case, we push it up to PEZ into a big giant whopping foundation that we run at Pivotal. And then because the Docker image is kind of big, it takes a little while to start, and then the app's up. And we can see that indeed, we have an app called Grabimon running in Cloud Foundry. And we can actually hit that app. And you'll see here that I actually added a monster there yesterday. Maybe let's make, I don't know, Pythonimon. And you'll see that up in the cloud, I think somewhere in California, Right now, grabby mons are being created in the cloud. So once we've got our microservice and we're continuously deploying it, we can then start thinking about how we're going to build an ecosystem of multiple microservices. Because like I said earlier, if we're doing microservices right, they almost never exist on their own. So we have a couple of options. We can reinvent the wheel and write our own uh, software for dealing with microservice ecosystems, or we can use uh, Netflix open source. And uh, there is a, there's an open source project for .NET that, called Steeltoe that uh, provides .NET clients for uh, Netflix OSS and uh, Spring Cloud services. 
So what we get uh, for free in Steeltoe is a client for Spring Cloud Config Server, uh, the ability to uh, discover and register with service discovery in Eureka. We have uh, some convenience wrappers around configuration for uh, Spring Cloud connectors. And this client will work either with the uh, straight out of GitHub Netflix OSS or with Spring Cloud services inside your PCF uh, foundation. And as far as I know, the initial release for Steeltoe is Q3 2016. Is that still true? Okay. You can correct us now so we don't say the wrong message. <laughs> yeah. And uh, like I said, it, it is an open source project. So if you do intend to use some of this open source uh, Netflix stuff, then we, we strongly encourage you to go contribute. One of the big things that we see when moving applications to the cloud is the usually the first thing we have to do is externalize the app's configuration. So in legacy ASP.NET apps, that means moving the configuration out of web.config. In a .NET Core app, that means by default we can we usually get like an application.json file which has local defaults in it. We can then add environment variables. Uh, to allow us to read the, uh, the values that PCF injects into our application's environment. We can then call add cloud foundry, which reads the service binding information for our application and then makes that available either as raw values or through dependency injection into our controllers. We can also get configuration data. We can, do it, we can get that uh, configuration information uh, both in raw form as well as, uh, as objects that we can inject into the controller. And all of this configuration merging is done in a, a last added wins pattern, so you choose the override order. Generally, people choose uh, uh, local and then environment, then Cloud Foundry, then config server in that order. Uh, there are, a few, like I said, we have a, a couple of convenience wrappers for talking to specific types of backing services. Uh, SQL Server within any Framework 6, MySQL, and Redis. Uh, RabbitMQ is currently being worked on. And at the moment, all of these are Windows only. Uh, hopefully that'll change soon. Uh, <clears throat> and so, one of the, I think, the most common backing service that you're going to find in, in uh, microservice is probably a connection to a database. And one of the concerns people had with Core being a complete rewrite is, does it have all the libraries that my old, my old applications needed? And for the most part, if it's truly a microservice, then you, you probably have everything you need in there. But uh, So we have SQL Server, Postgres, Mongo, any database that exposes a RESTful endpoint. Uh, DB2 is not available and will likely never be available for core. And uh, I believe Oracle is working on a driver for .NET Core. And in classic Microsoft version number confusing, confusing madness, NAD Framework 1.0 is the new version for core, and NAD Framework 6 is the old version. So It's like Orwell did it, right? What's that? Like Orwell did it, right? Yeah. So uh, during some of the betas, it, it got even more confusing, but I think that's the last remnant of uh, version number insanity that we'll have to deal with. So we're going to do a demo and connect our microservice to uh, backing services. All right. So this is probably the first real fun step that we're going to have because it's been pretty terrible up to this right, point. Right, because it's been absolutely miserable. Um, but we're actually going to use stuff that has Spring in the name now, which validates this presentation for the conference. It's the only reason they let us here. It's the only reason. Um, so what we're going to do is, is demonstrate the use of config server. And to do that, we need something to configure. And it's going to be a new repository. We're going to swap out our memory repository for a SQL server-based repository. And we are going to use uh, EF uh, uh, under the hood for that. 1.0. 1.0, right. Um, 
So we're going to have to start adding some, some pretty significant uh, uh, dependencies here. We're going to add EF so we can talk to databases. We're also going to add a uh, steel toe config server dependency. There's actually a, a special method to, that you have to do for steel toe for now that you can see in the docs. Um, so then once those dependencies are resolved, we can see that we have a new implementation of our iMonsters repository. So you can start to see why that, that, uh, why that interface, why its existence is justified. And we have a repository that basically does the same stuff, CRUD operations of monsters, except it actually persisted using EF now. You will note that in the constructor for the SQL Server monster repository, a application DB context is injected. That essentially represents a database connection. That's the thing we're going to configure with Spring Cloud Config Server. Now, in our startup, we'll see that we actually made a lot of changes here. But firstly, rather than our memory repository, we're injecting our SQL Server repository. Also, we're telling our DB contexts to derive their connection string from configuration. We didn't say what configuration, just configuration. And we will worry about where later. Uh, in the constructor for startup now, we've started to define multiple configuration sources. The first one you see in our list is app settings JSON, and you'll also see the real money, right, config server. So if we look at our configuration sources, if we actually look at our app settings JSON, this probably looks pretty darn familiar to a lot of Spring Boot developers. Uh, we actually have a Spring section, we define a name for our application, and we define a source config server to use. Um, and in... Yeah, please don't hack that server until we're done with the yes. demo. Right here, we have a super secret connection string. Don't copy that down and don't hack -sore us with that. Um, but that is going to be the connection string that will arrive down here. So now, how many times have I typed .NET wrong so far? Just like one or two. You screwed Emacs up all the time. I do screw Emacs even. It's like the thing I type the most too. I don't understand. You spend all your time worrying about .NET. That's correct. So now we're going to run our app again. We will issue a get. Now this time, because we're bound against a real live SQL server that already had some data in it, you'll see that there are some monsters sticking in there already. Right, we have C-sharp amon, golang amon, and erlang amon. We can make our .NET amon again. And it's added to the list. So now we've swapped ourselves over by way of DI uh, into a, a SQL server repository. So now that we have uh, our, now that our microservice is starting to look more full featured, we're connecting to a database, we've got it in a CI pipeline, it looks more like a real service. We want that service now to participate in an ecosystem of other services. We want it to register its own presence and then to detect the presence of other services so that it can talk to them. So normally when we talk to a backing service, Somewhere in our configuration, whether it's in a properties file or an environment variable or a bound service, we have a URL that looks like this, and that's how we talk to uh, one of our supporting microservices. What we really want to do is use a logical URL that looks more like this, where Eureka, it, Eureka's service registration is going to replace the word grabs there with wherever the grab service happens to be at the time. And that way, our application is blissfully unaware of where that service is, uh, either through configuration or code. Uh, 
So to do this in .NET Core and Steeltoe, it's actually uh, surprisingly easy. The first thing we're going to do is create a, a discovery client handler, and we pass that to the stock .NET Core uh, HTTP client. And then as soon as we make a simple HTTP request, Steeltoe takes over and swaps the logical URL with the last known URL of the service I'm trying to talk to. And then, as I said, the application code is never aware of where that service really is. So we're going to do a demo and show adding service discovery. That was funny. Joe just came in. So glad you weren't here about 10 minutes ago, buddy. Yeah, nobody tell him what we said. Nobody tell him what we said. All right, so we'll move on to the next step. And what we're going to do is actually use the Yurkit client from Steeltoe. And again, new stuff, more dependencies. We're going to use Steeltoe's uh, like basic disco discovery client and Eureka client. And now we're going to need basically a service to discover. So we happen to have a Spring Boot service hanging around up in the cloud that allows us to uh, essentially get histories of when our monsters were grabbed and then also uh, uh, actually do writes, grab the monsters. So we can then take that service, discover it, and merge it with uh, our initial service, I'm treating that as a, a, as a microservice. Now, what we have here is actual Eureka running up in, up in EC2. This service happens to be sitting there. Uh, it happens to be running in Cloud Foundry because that's where the cool kids run their services. We will now add a discovery client to our, to our startup. And then actually add a mechanism for our service to talk to our backing microservice. This is a client for the grab service that we wrote in Spring Boot. You'll see that we have a host name, generic host name called grab service. That's not a real host. Eureka's gonna swap that out with the, the proper discovered host name. For the most part, the rest of this client is just typical stuff, right? This is just typical .NET HTTP client business. The difference in this case is we're going to inject a, a, a special URL handler that is, the Eureka client is going to use to swap out the host names with the discovered, discovered guy. So now, we can pull in our new dependencies, which are going to be our Eureka client. We can do a run here. Actually, let me show you something better first. So we're going to add a couple of uh, actions to our basic monsters controller, one of which is going to be that we're going to allow our controller to dig into some of that metadata from the microservice. So we'll be able to, for a specific given monster, call the backing service to get a count of how many times it's been grabbed. Uh, also get a little bit of a history, inject the last time the monster was grabbed. This way we could see if our users are grabbing them all. Um, and then we will basically do a kind of a proxy with a post that will allow this service to trickle the grab down to the backing service. So, We can hit up that action we just made, and we can see that for Golangamon, for the specified monster, it's been grabbed 14 times, and that's how many seconds since the epic it's been, it was grabbed. We can do a couple write operations into our proxy and see that our .NET service has indeed 
called our boot service that it discovered by way of Eureka. So we ran through a uh, large amount of stuff at a pretty high level. Uh, we just wanted to make sure that we could get from start at hello world all the way to a fully functioning microservice that uh, uses Spring Cloud services. One of the reasons why we did that is to show the relatively small gap from starting with four lines of C-sharp code to finishing with a full microservice. We also wanted to demonstrate that you can build uh, C-sharp microservices on any device, Mac, Linux, or that other operating system. Uh, you can then deploy that to uh, the cloud. And uh, you probably noticed that we had both a .NET service and a Spring Boot service running on the same Eureka server, uh, able to discover each other and interoperate. And just one more time, we don't have to use IIS anymore. Right. And uh, like at the end of the day, what we've demonstrated by using Docker, by using Worker, by using Cloud Foundry, by using .NET, um, and by using a Spring Boot backing service, is at this point, we have dogs, cats, ferrets all living together. You know, the world didn't stop. Everything's actually working well. And it, it was pretty painless. All right, so I think uh, hopefully we, we should have plenty of time for Q&A right now. Yep. And if you have questions or complaints about Steel Toe, I think the guys are around here somewhere. We didn't work on Complaints can go over there. We'll answer the questions. All complaints actually go to Zach anyway, because he's good with those. Sure. So, how have you guys used the .NET Core So there's a, a couple of reasons why. I mean, the, the, the .NET Core build pack is perfectly capable of doing what we want it to do. Uh, when I was talking about the CI pipeline, one of the benefits of that pipeline is the immutable artifact. We're not running our code through a build pack to produce something to test. We have our code in a Docker image that we can then test and then run that code, put that Docker image in an environment with other services and run integration tests on that. And all of that is done automatically in the build pipeline. There's nothing stopping us from using the build pack for, for CF push. Uh, we just were, were using Docker for the, the CI pipeline and uh, to illustrate that there are other options for deployment. That was more like, right, to, to sort of demonstrate the like, a portability option. In general, if you were going to be targeting CF and then go try to deploy .NET Core apps today, the recommendation that I would at least have for people would be to use the Core Build Pack. It's well maintained by good people. Um, this was just one way of getting there, and we did kind of want to demonstrate, you know, the dogs and cats living together to kind of show all these pieces running together and working seamlessly. Sorry. So the SQL Server was not provisioned in CF. We were just pointing at a SQL Server that we've got running in the cloud. Uh, there are some open source SQL Server service brokers that, that can be used to provision SQL Server on demand for you. Well, we just didn't use that. And the... Sure. Sure. Yeah, that, that, was, that came by way of config server. That was, that was sitting up in the Git repository backing the config server. Um, that, uh, the, the details aren't important, but that just happened to be a SQL server running an RDS just because it was easy to provision quickly. Yeah, you could very, you could, using the same, the same code base, you could have it talk to a SQL server where the connection string came from a user provided service. It can come from, like you said, it can come from a SQL service broker or it can come from like we used uh, the config server. I, I didn't hear all of it. He's a customer, so do it. Any more questions?
can go back uh, if you want to switch over to the code. Yeah. Where was the reference you were talking about? In the dependencies? Oh, application.json, yeah, this here. So this is the URL to the Spring Cloud config server? This is just one of many options for being able to supply that URL. Just this happens to be one of the easiest ways to get that in there. Right, this yep. is this is the, the config server from the Netflix OSS donation that's, that's essentially running to supply config uh, you would typically use for Spring Boot apps. Right, this might, if this was uh, an on-prem PCF, this might be the URL to the ASCS tile. It's, it's really cool in general. If it's something you're not familiar with, it's, it's, it's super useful. We're getting there. I wouldn't say we have it. We're uh, yes. So all the code for the book is is going to be in Git as we uh, complete things. And uh, I don't know the exact details, but O'Reilly has a, a thing where they do where they'll publish beta portions of the book. So you should be able to get early access to that. There was a there. There we go. So actually, in, in terms of Cloud Foundry, Azure really doesn't necessarily have anything to do with it per se. Um, you could run Cloud Foundry in Azure. You could run Cloud Foundry uh, on vSphere or wherever you like. Um, and then you can use Windows cells. We can add Windows cells to Diego. They can run legacy ASP.NET code. Um, and it uses a hosted web core, which is kind of like a slice of IS, but it isn't a full-blown IS itself. Um, the idea, the reason that you would use that is to not use IES, right? Um, but yeah, you can run uh, legacy apps. You still have to adhere to good practices in 12-factor, et cetera, but it is, it is possible. So the like Kestrel is is a essentially just a, a lightweight embedded web server. So the way that you run it in production is behind a reverse proxy. Um, so in the case of Cloud Foundry, right, like there's the layer of Go routers that sit at the top. You could put Nginx in front of it or Tomcat or whatever you like in front of it. Um, in, in, in essentially the same pattern that you would probably use with your typical Spring Boot app. Right, but do, which, is, which is actually kind of like a similar pattern you might use for Node or, or whatever you want to hurt yourself with. Yeah, so just to add to your question though, there is no, there's no, there's no Tomcat for C-sharp uh, or for right. .NET Core. Uh, I, I consider that a good thing. And, um, but there's also nothing preventing you from writing your own web server. All of these things are completely pluggable and open source. So if you don't want to use Kestrel and you want a specialized one, you can write your own, or you can contribute to Kestrel. Behind PT? Yeah. Yep, that's you. Sure. 
Sure. So there's a, a whole bunch of questions in there. We'll try and take them one at a time. Uh, first and foremost, I think the, the, the key thing to remember is that SteelToe is designed as a .NET client for Spring Cloud services. We, we're almost out of time, but um, it's designed to be a Spring Cloud services client that looks like idiomatic .NET code. So a .NET developer will look at this code and think that it looks like what they're familiar with. The, the intention wasn't to make it look like Spring Boot code or to look familiar to Java developers, because I mean, generally you're not going to have Java developers switching to .NET. It's more along the lines of you have .NET developers trying to take advantage of the same services that the Java developers can. And in that regard, the roadmap is designed to eventually have parity with what you have functionally in, uh, in your Java client. But I don't think you're ever going to get to a point where the C Sharp code is indistinguishable from the Java code, because th there are some fundamental differences between the languages, even though at a glance, sometimes they look very similar. Right, and this, this isn't an attempt to necessarily evangelize .NET per se, right? But um, there is you know, a, a serious, very serious dedicated group of developers who want to continue to use .NET going forward, right? They're going to continue to do that. And uh, you know, it, 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 that's fine as well. People that want to use Java and do things the boot way, that's fine. Yep, so keep booting. All right, I think we're, we're out of time. We're out. So, so thank you. Yeah.